Let's talk about your rather nice theorem of Cauchy. So we know from Lagrange's theorem that if we have a finite group and we have a subgroup of that group, then the order of the subgroup divides the order of the group. And in general, the converse isn't true, but we can get kind of partial converses in certain situations, and this is an example. So let G be a finite group, and let P be a prime, dividing the order of G. Then G contains an element of order P. And consequently, that element generates a subgroup of order P. But the crucial thing is that we have an element of order P. So this, we're going to see at some point that it matters that P is prime. You can watch out for that. So let's think about how to prove this. And we're going to use the theory of group actions here. So the idea is we define a set, so if I let S be the set, and I'm going to take all the ordered P tuples, where all of the elements are in this group, with the property that the product of the elements of the P tuple is the identity. So we're looking for an element of order P, which will be an element G, so that this P tuple as product, the identity for G isn't itself the identity. So we're hoping to show that there's some p-tuple in this set where each of the entries is equal, but they're not the identity. So what can we say about the size of this set? Well, it's the size of the group G to the power of p minus 1, because I can choose any G1, any G2, and so on, all the way up to G p minus 1. It gives me this many things, and then GP is uniquely determined. There will be exactly one possibility for GP. Now we can think of a suitable group as acting on this set. So if I let sigma be the P cycle that just cycles 1 up to P in order, that's in the symmetric group and P elements, and then it generates a subgroup, let's call it H, and we can think of that as acting on S via well, sigma applied to this p-tuple is just what we get when we cycle the elements around. And then similarly for powers of sigma. So we just cycle these elements in this p-tuple round. And of course that's still in the set because it preserves this property that the product of the entries is the identity. So we can just check that this defines an action. I'm not going to do that right now. So we have the order of this group H is P, because it's generated by an element of order P. So by the orbit stabilizer theorem, we see that um, the size of each orbit for this action is 1 or p, because one of the consequences of the orbit stabilizer theorem is that the size of any orbit divides the size of the group, and in our case that size is prime. This is where it's important that p is prime, so the size of each orbit is 1 or p. So if we say there are, let's say, k orbits of size 1, and l orbits of size p, so what do we know? Um, then k is certainly greater than or equal to 1, as there's an orbit of size 1, which is just what we have with the identity, repeatedly. So this element is certainly in our set S, and if we act on it via any of these um, entries in this group, then we just get the same thing back. So it, this is an orbit of size 1. And what else can we say about the number of orbits of size 1 and the number of orbits of size p? Well, the orbits partition the set, this is an important fact about orbits of group actions, so the size of s, which we know is the size of g to the p minus 1, well, what is that? That's the number of orbits of size 1, which is k, and then each of the orbits of size p contributes p, so we get l times p here. 
But now we know that our p prime p divides the order of g, so it divides the left hand side, it divides this part of the right hand side, so it divides k, which is this minus this. So p divides k, but k is some positive integer. So in fact, k must be greater than or equal to p. So there is some other orbit of size 1, so let's say it contains the p triple g1, g2, up to gp. This is another orbit, so with the gi, not all the identity. Now what does it mean to say that this orbit has size 1? Well, it means that if we apply sigma to this p-tuple, we get back, well, we know how sigma acts on it, we get this p-tuple here, but also we have to land in this orbit, so this must be equal to g1 to the gp. So we must have g1 being equal to g2, being equal to g3, and so on. But knowing that this p tuple is in our set S means that the product of these elements must be the identity. So g1 to the p must be e. So g1 is in g, it's not the identity element, and it has that its p power is the identity, so g1 has order p, because its order must divide this power p, in fact about orders, and again p is prime, so the only possibility is 1 or p, it's not 1 because it's not the identity, so it must have order p. So we've established the existence of an element of order P. Isn't that pretty?